People always ask me what type of marketing we do at the practice to see on average 165 new patients each and every month. And I always say the same thing, reviews. And more importantly, I rank high on Google. You may have heard me talk in the past about how my practice's website and Google search ranking has been the most beneficial element to my practice's growth. Well, I've been happily working with the same marketing person for the past four years, and now you can too. Relevance Online Marketing will take you from non-existence to the top of the pack using the revolutionary approach to SEO and pay-per-click advertising. No contracts, no BS, and only the results that you can take to the bank. So if you are looking for a marketing company that gives your practice the attention and care it deserves, look no further than Relevance Online Marketing. Mention Dental Practice Heroes and get your first month free, risk-free, with absolutely no obligations. Relevance Online Marketing will take your online marketing from zero to hero. Go to RelevanceOnlineMarketing.com and set up a demo today. That's RelevanceOnlineMarketing.com and gear up for some real practice growth. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Dental Practice Heroes podcast. We're doing another clinical episode. I got the guys from Colorado Surgical Institute, Dr. Dimbrisky and Dr. Tahir Dune. What's happening, guys? Paul, what's up, brother? What's going on, man? Just wrapped up a clinical day. Yeah, Tahir just like ran in the room <laughs> with a cape on, like, and he's wiping blood off of his forehead, and <laughs> he's still got his gloves on. He is a mess right now. That's he why just I wear black scrubs and not white scrubs. <laughs> I think I saw him carrying a case of like fifty grand because he just sold a treatment plan. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a little awkward when someone brings cash in. Yeah, so yeah. Like, have them bring that much cash. It's like, dude, give me a check or cashier's check. Everyone feels better about it. I had a guy come in for veneers, and he just won like a poker tournament, and he's like, it was like fifteen k or something like that, upper lower, and he and he goes, "Would you do it for 12? And I'm like. Ah, uh, he's like, if I paid you cash right now, and I'm like, okay, yeah, and he just threw it on the table and like sat back in his chair. <laughs> that's pretty. And I go, cool. wow. <laughs> I go, that's not something you see every day. And he goes, you do in my world, man. <laughs> so I drove around with that with my pocket for like four days. I just see sitting in bed, just like a bunch of hundred dollar bills, just like playing with it and stuff. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't want to take it to the bank, and I'm like, I don't know, me. It was too much money. Like I, I couldn't handle it. Yeah. It was, it was like my brain was like, wow, this is a lot of hundred dollar bills. I just couldn't fathom what to do with it, but I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm never too sure about people who walk around with ten grand or more in cash in their pocket. It's just like, yeah, let's do some veneers. Like, I think some some shady stuff is going on. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So, what are we talking about today, guys? Oh man, we are going to touch base on some block rafting, and this one's a fun one. This one we do at our advanced course, and I'll, I'll let Brisky get into the minutia of like all the details on this one because this one you want to do perfect. I think Dr. Brisky is doing them super fast these days, but in the beginning planned for about two hours, but we're getting block rafts from the Rocky Mountain Tissue Bank in Colorado, and it's literally a vertebral block raft from a cadaver with a cortical outer layer and a spongy inner layer that you can form to the maxilla and mandible, and then we're screwing it down with some screws and growing horizontal width of the bone. And when I do this procedure, and granted, we do a lot of surgery, I still think this one is really cool. Like when I see it on my schedule, I'm, I'm pumped to do it. So Dr. Brisky, why don't you take it away and kind of talk through how we approach everything from A to Z? Yeah, of course. So let's all picture a CT right now. Like we take a, an x-ray of a CT, like we take a CT, we zoom in, we're like, man, this case is going to be a slam dunk. And then we look at the actual slice of the x-ray and we see the buccal lingual distance is six millimeters or less. Then we're thinking, man, I, can I really squeeze a 3.5 millimeter implant in there? For most people, the answer is probably no. Some of us with a little bit more advanced techniques, we can definitely squeeze an implant in, you know, a 3.5 or a 4. But at that point, we need to augment the bone so it has more bone on the buccal side. So our options would go, uh, we could do titanium mesh, right? That one sounds fancy. It's definitely difficult. We have tunnel grafting is an option. You can do some onlay grafting, and that can be with a tax, screws, membranes, and we'd have to secure the graft with periosteal sutures. But our favorite is actually a block graft. For us, it's a procedure in our hands that we can get predictively finished from start to finish within 25 minutes. I think the three and a half millimeters, I could probably get a three and a half millimeter in there as long as you didn't check it with a comb beam. Yep. <laughs> if you just take a dude dimensional x-ray, it's going to look great. Yeah. <laughs> I got skills. 
And here's the thing. You can do, you know, ridge splitting and you can do expansion techniques. And it's it's definitely a lot of variables involved, depending on whether you choose to do it a certain way or not. But at the end of the day, if it's, you know, five millimeters, six millimeters or less, and you want to make sure you're going in predictably and then saving the future version of yourself a hard conversation in three to five years, definitely consider the block graph. One of the main complications we see on block graphs after uh, we see all these post-ops at the course is uh, incision line opening over the top. And that's because the periosteal release to get all that tissue to come up and over that huge amount of horizontal width you've just grown and closing that and getting passive closure, that's actually the tricky part. And if you were to tell me in the beginning, like, dude, closing the incision line is the hard part and screwing a block of bone down to a jaw is the easy part. I wouldn't think that's that's the truth, but that's literally where we see the main amount of complications going on. Now, do you still do ridge splits or is this like this has replaced this for this kind of issue? You're going block graft now. I still think there's a place for ridge splits. I think it's less and less common, though. So there's the Corey plate technique that some people are liking, but the complications on that are a little bit more invasive is when you literally get the block from the the ramus and, and move that. I'm not a huge fan of teaching that one at this time. I think there's some place for it, but I think the Rocky Mountain Tissue Bank block graphs by far have the easiest application, really turn around into good vital bone, are the easiest ones to implement right off the bat. So with ridge splits, yeah, you can still do it. There's a lot of super skilled surgeons doing it. But I think if you're getting into this or if you're a general practitioner or if you're trying to add horizontal growth to your practice, uh, start with the, the block graphs for sure. So, Paul, I'm so glad you brought that up as soon as I if it was like speaking there a second ago, because a lot of people think, man, I could squeeze that implant in there. But what happens if something goes wrong and you have now all of a sudden this huge buckle bone defect that you not only have to repair once, you may have to graft it a second time just to get the bone back. So for Dr. Dune and myself, we've gone away from really squeezing things in to predictively building the bone out we're going to have a predictable result and we're not keeping ourselves up at night wondering what's going to happen. Now, is this only a width graft? I mean, can you grow vertical height with this as well? You can get about two millimeters of vertical height. So it's not meant to be a, like a vertical height gain, but it can gain up to about two millimeters predictively. Okay. So from a clinical perspective, for those of you who have listened to how we approach medical histories before, same exact thing. Just make sure that they can tolerate surgery, implants, bone grafting, whatever the case may be. We're, for time purposes, we're not going to dive into that. But right from the get-go, you're going to evaluate biotype. So maxillary block grafts, in my hands, anecdotally speaking, are way more successful than mandibular. And then it gets even harder when you go posterior mandible. Typically, people are missing 19 or 30. And then the tissue is a lot of mobile tissue and they have 18 and 20. That for me is one of the harder ones to do because you're trying to get a block in between two teeth, getting the angulation and everything correct, the thin tissue, maybe having to do a periosteal release on the the lingual, which is complicated. For me, that's one of the harder places to go. So in the beginning, you can do uh, mandibular anterior segments or something in the maxilla for your first maybe five cases start there if you're going to pick anywhere to start. Or if you're cavalier and the patient's totally cool and you want to give it a try and they understand that, you know, you're going to repair for free or it may not work and then you just have to do the bridge, then go posterior mandible, but at least go into it knowing that if your first one fails, it's not necessarily you. It's just a complex area to, to be working for the first one. I'd feel bad if it failed. Like this is somebody's vertebrae and they gave it for us to do a successful procedure I feel like that when I throw away like two chicken breasts, like when I just don't cook them. I'm like, this person, this bird's purpose was to be cooked and eaten, and we just threw them away. So you, you better make sure you do it right, guys. Yeah. Don't mess it up because then, you know, you're going to hear Paul in the background sighing a big sigh of like, yeah. So, yeah. so someone literally broke their back to give us this graft. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what do we do, Brisky? So the biggest reason why we're picking these vertebral grafts is probably a lot of people thinking, well, why are you not harvesting this? Well, the biggest thing is we're trying to avoid a second site of an incision. It's not fun for someone. I mean, say the typical appointment time for us start to finish with the ramus block is about an hour and a half. 
but the typical start to finish time with a vertebral graph for us is about like 30 minutes. <laughs> so even for us, the timing is less. In most situations, especially in the maxillary interior or mandibular interior, the vertebral graft is a better option rather than going for, you know, as long as you're not going for like vertical height to the graft, so a second, second incision. So typically, some of the materials that we're going to be using are right, the Rocky Mountain Tissue Bank vertebral block, pericardium or alloderm. So over the top of the block is going to go pericardium or, or we can use alloderm. And alloderm is a tissue. You know, it's a tissue graft. So we use the thin version. It's called Alloderm GBR, or the thickness is usually 0.75 millimeters to 1.25 millimeters. There are several brands out there. We use the Strauman one because we're associated with Neodent. You know, there are other ones too, like BioHorizons has a Alloderm GBR as well. For screws, you can use any type of screw you want. We use the Tatum surgical kit, easy fixation screw kit. Same thing, Neodent has some screws that we use as well. In terms of antibiotic, we actually add antibiotic into our graft or rehydrate the block with gentamicin or metronidazole is a good one to do. And then we also just use like our always, we use an everyday graft material. We use 50-50 cortical kinsellus allograft. Yeah, I'm also going to soak the alloderm in the gentamicin or any of my membranes being used in this site in the gentamicin as well. You can draw PRP, you can do the sticky bone technique, and so that way it kind of stays in one place. And then you can consider if you're not doing uh, PRF and PRP in your practice and doing sticky bone, you can do the Woodland Hills Pharmacy. Man, what is that called again? Fusion bone binder. The fusion bone mm-hmm. binder to thicken up your graft so it's more like a cement so it stays in one location and doesn't kind of drift around on you. Yeah, so remember we're, we're adding up to five millimeters of width of graft, right? That's like a, that's a thumb right there. So <laughs> if you're going to make an incision, the one thing you have to make sure you avoid is the, uh, you know, oh crap, I can't close it, right? Like that's the number one rule. So that's why it's so important to go observe at classes, take sur- live surgical classes and actually learn how to effectively do periosteal releasing incisions and even vertical releasing incisions if you can't get things closed. Yeah, one thing that's hard to, and we're going to go through it verbally, but one thing that's hard to to visualize when you're listening to this is how to get a periosteal release in a way where you're going to get so much mobility in the tissue that you can literally peel it over and wrap around the palate or peel it over and get all the way over the tongue because you need passivity in this. So when you're going to do it, what I do is I grab the tissue on the buckle in between the transition line from the keratinized to the mobile tissue. And I'll make an incision into the tissue. If it's really a thin biotype, I'm not using the cutting end of the scalpel. I'm using, I'm kind of turning it 90 degrees and scoring it with the scalpel. And you'll just kind of see the periosteum peel up. But when you get that initial incision made, and you know, obviously, having cut through the buckle of the tissue, so check that every once in a while and be very cognizant of it, you're going to Turn your scalpel 90 degrees, and with just the tip of the scalpel, you're going to drag it through that same incision point, and you're going to feel these little strings, these little fibers. It's like plucking a guitar, and as you pluck all of them moving from one side to the other, you're going to start to feel the the tension in the, the tissue give, and you're going to get a whole lot of passivity in there. Obviously, on the palate, this is a no-fly zone, and in the mandibular lingual area, do not do that. If anything, all you can do is you can kind of stretch it with your hand a little bit, maybe use a finger with some gauze and just put a little bit of tension into it and you can get mobility. Do not try a scalpel on the lingual for a long time, for a really, really long time where you might get into a lot of trouble. Yeah, there's like three different muscle uh, layers on the mandible. Uh, Right on the lingual side, there's three different muscle layers. So you have to be really, really careful. It's a very advanced technique to try to release the lingual. And that's usually for vertical height gains. So if you're just going purely horizontal, which I would say would be the first step of block grafting, you got to save the lingual. That's a very highly effect. That's a very uh, advanced technique that I don't advise trying, to be very clear. (laughs) 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 So just like Dr. Dune was saying, how, how I actually do it, I do it very similar. So I make my one big horizontal cut through the periosteum. After that, you can choose to use the 15 blade to cut some vertical blunt dissection because there's, you know, there's these quotation guitar strings that run 
horizontally and vertically. So you can actually get a increased tissue closure by releasing both components. But after I make my horizontal cut, I actually like to use a curette, like a 2-4 curette. And I'll grab the tissue with a tissue forcep, and then I'll stick the sharp side underneath where I put my incision. And then I just hold, I push it upwards. And I showed this a couple of times in, in our classes recently. People's eyes were like, holy smokes, how did you just created a simple incision and then somehow use your finger to go underneath the curette and now you can touch to your nose with the flap, <laughs> right? Like how much closure you can get. So pretty important point there. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, I, I learned something at all of these courses also and the amount that he could get just by adding that, it got like, like an extra inch of passivity in the tissue. And then the third way to do it, just so we can, we don't have 17 ways to do a periosteal release, but the third way to do it is scissors go in, closed inside your incision and then you open them up and you're basically blunt dissecting the periosteum away from the tissue so you're not cutting anything you're just sticking the scissors in and opening the scissors and stretching the tissue out from that way so you can get tension release in your tissue i like to do all of this in the very beginning so all my bleeding has occurred we're working on the block raft. So then by the time I'm done, I'm just going to start suturing. I don't have blood everywhere from the periosteal release being done. So I like to do all of this releasing before I even get started on my block. Yeah, because for the most part, when you're doing these types of grafts, these are going to be bowl-shaped defects. So the block literally just, you push it into the bowl and you suture it, right? So first, you're going to flap it and you're going to do exactly what Dr. Dune said. You're going to release the tissue to make sure that you can actually close this thing. Because if you can't close it, you should probably just close it back up and not even attempt it. So visualize the defect. Then we're going to soak the bone block in antibiotic, like gentamicin or metronidazole. Then we're going to trim and shape the block graft. So we actually use just a pair of scissors. You know, some people might use a 15 blade. It actually a pair of scissors with these grafts is actually the most effective way to cut it. This is different from anyone that's picturing me saying, how do you trim with a pair of scissors? You know, this is not a J block or a cortical block that's made out of, you know, that looks like a piece of concrete. So yes, you can actually trim this with a pair of scissors as opposed to you sculpting a cortical block or a J block, you know, for like a half an hour to try to get this thing to fit in there. So after we trim it, um, what we do is I actually just press the block graft in the mouth into the defect. You can actually, it's actually kind of moldable because it's so spongy. You can press the block in and it actually starts to form around the area you're trying to graft, which is really cool. After that, I don't trim anymore. I just try to get it pretty approximated because the smaller that you make the block graft, the harder it is going to be to put screws in and then also keep it from fracturing. So first, put the, you, you just attach it. So there's always this argument that I hear about decorticating bone. Paul, what have you heard in the past about decorticating bone? That if you don't, you won't get enough vascularity to heal the graft? Yep. So what's crazy is there's a lot of articles that actually show that that's not true, which is blew my mind when I found this out. So decorticating, research says you only do it if you, if you feel like it's going to make you sleep better at nighttime. <laughs> mm. Here's the thing. I still decorticate even though I've read the research. You know, I have success decorticating. Doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> it looks really cool. It takes 30 seconds. I decorticate. Also, what I'll do is um, sometimes I'll kind of draw out where my block is going and I'll put a little couple of lines and scribe out. So when the block graph sits on the ridge, it actually can physically sit on a ledge. That way it doesn't slide around as much. And then I'll, I'll put pressure with my thumb and kind of rotate the thumb around a little bit to uh, adapt it to the scribed ridge. And, uh, and then I move forward. But the big thing for me is before decortication, I'm cleaning the crest. Sometimes I'll even use a acrylic burr or something where I'm just cleaning the bone, super clean, getting all the little periosteal fibers off of there. There's tissue in between your block graft and the ridge it's not going to integrate. You're going to get tissue. So make sure you clean that super thoroughly. Yep. So if you're going to decorticate, which you should, but if you remember, if you forget, don't lose any sleep, it's going to integrate. So just re-decorticate. Decorticate, we use a number two uh, round burr, like a carbide and a high speed is all we use. And we make a bunch of different holes. Each hole is probably like two millimeters away from the other one. 
Uh, then you try the block graph back in, can slightly compress it again to make sure it's still reproducible in terms of uh, you know where you're going to put it. Then you're going to put screws in. Typically, we place two screws unless the area is so narrow you just can't fit two screws in, but that's probably highly unlikely. So first screw that goes in will be uh, just to fixate the block. Now picture if you have a screw in the middle of a block, that block can spin, right? It can spin in a circle. So your second screw is going to be your anti-rotation screw, is all it does. So the first fixates it, and the second one prevents the block from rotating. Now, I drill a pilot hole when I do this, and Tatum has a certain pilot drill that corresponds with their screws. And they also have different lengths on the screws. Like It's like 8 to 14, or I don't know, it's maybe 16. I, I don't know how many lengths they have. The, the average I use is a 10 or 12. Vast majority of the time, sometimes in super narrow places an eight. What I do is I hold the block in place with an instrument and then I'm not taking my eye off the block. And then I take the drill and I go drill my pilot and I'm still watching the block. And my assistant hands me now the screw and it goes right in through the block that's still in the same place, that's in the same place on the ridge, going through the same hole and just locking it down. Because if that thing shifts at all, the apex of your your tad fixation screw, your... your um, Tatum screw is not going to go and engage the jaw itself, and you're going to lose your ability to fixate it properly. And then the thing slides around, you're messing around with it too much, and you can fracture the block, and then you got to start over. And I don't know how much the blocks cost, but it's, it's a waste of a couple hundred bucks for sure. Yep, 150 bucks if you break it. <laughs> so not, the, not terrible, but you still want to avoid it. Uh, Rocky Mountain's good about exchanging blocks out too. I've had a few that have cracked, and I felt like it was because of the block. I'll leave it up to everyone else on the audio that it was me or if it was the block itself. Like 500 <laughs> but, uh, calls for broken blocks. <laughs> just saying, there is a chance, yeah. <laughs> We're like sending in like dead cats, like this yeah. didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so after we get the block fixated, we're going to remove all the sharp edges. I like to use a diamond round burr, number eight, and I trim very, you know, pretty aggressively all around the block to make sure there are no sharp edges anywhere. After that, I mean, I grew up like building houses with my dad and we built this house up north. And so whenever I, t- I say grout, well, the next step is you actually grout around the edges of the block raft. So you just fill in the little holes, you know, where each of the walls are. And even on top of the block, you grout around the edges. And I actually use a combination of 50-50 cortical cancellus and xenograft. And what it does is the xenograft adds a level of space maintenance that way the bone can't remodel too fast and it sticks around. So that way you don't get resorption of the block or you don't get tissue migration into it. So as long as, you know, I think the biggest complaint about block wraps that we hear are, oh, they resorb, they resorb like 20 to 30%. Like, eh, no, they don't. They don't if you know how to effectively apply principles of space maintenance to a grafting situation. And I like to use a very fine particle for the xenograft. Sometimes they come in like this really big, unrefined thing, and it just gets everywhere. Make sure your xenograft is, is, do you know the particle size on it, Brisky? It's just 0.25 to 1, okay. just yeah. like a cortical cancellus. Yeah, cool. And then after that, we're going to trim and fit a piece of pericardium or alloderm. And when I say or, it depends how much room you have, right? Remember, alloderm is a little bit thicker. If you're really good with your parous releasing, then, hey, that's amazing. Let's do a soft tissue graft at the same time as we do the block graft, right? But if we can't fit it in, then just don't try to squeeze it. Definitely just add the pericardium and then suture it closed. Now, are you fixating your pericardium in place? Any like pro-fix screws? Any, um, what's that, that sling suture, periosteal suture? I will sometimes do it, but I don't know. Do you do it every time? I suture my membrane to the lingual, actually, my lingual part of my membrane to the lingual tissue. And then I graft around the edges and then I flip the membrane over. So that way it's just like it's ready for you to flip it over. So picture this, right? You screw the block in and then you trim the block. Then you will suture your pericardium to the lingual tissue and then you just flip it up. And then you graft and then you flip the membrane back over. That way, it's just kind of ready for you to do, so you're not continuously messing with it. What if you can't close over the the membrane? Are you worried about the alloderm if you don't get closure? You still technically want primary closure, right? 
but if it opens up one to two millimeters, then it will still survive, which is the best part about having any a, a small area of the alloderm becoming exposed is that it will still, the graft will still maintain vitality. And for everybody, that's not all alloderms, not the old school alloderms. Old school stuff opens up, it stinks, it's gross, your block graft will fail. That's why we were very specific on this very thin alloderm GBR stuff that we can use. Awesome. We'll talk about Colorado Surgical Institute and the classes that you guys have. Man, we have we have a, quite a few classes now we're coming out with. So um, oral and IV sedation is in the mix. That's coming down the pipeline pretty soon. We have a crown and bridge course that we're going to kind of have phase treatment on how to use, you know, uh, VDOs and crown and bridge and uh, 3D printers and do like actually like dentition cases. But we also have wisdom teeth and single implants that we group together in one weekend. And we actually got done with that one, I think, like a weekend or two ago. And then we have our full arch course. Uh, you can do a single or double arch. You can also tack on laterals and uh, block rafting. So if you want to get after the block raft like we talked about today and get some repetition on that, that's going to be our full arch course. And you're going to see a lot of like really cool techniques being utilized at that one. I think our next one on that one is February. And if you go to the website, www.coloradosurgicalinstitute.com, you can find out the exact dates on that. But definitely sign up soon because I think we got maybe just a few spots left for the full arch one. And then we got you know a few for our single implant and wisdom tooth course in March. But yeah, a lot of stuff come down the pipeline, man. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, guys. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Paul. Awesome. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Doon from Colorado Surgical Institute. Just wanted to give you guys a shout out and let you know about the program. We have full arch surgeries. We have lateral sinus lifts. We have block rafting courses all done in one weekend with the whole digital workflow with photogametry units, scanners, 3D printers, milling, you name it, anything regarded to full arch, we cover in depth. We also have a PGCA course. What that is, it's the Postgraduate Clinical Accelerator course where we are going to be covering wisdom teeth, single implants, and it can be complex single implants with vertical sinus lifts. We'll also be covering full arch extractions with ridge reduction, bone grafting, PRP, suturing, and we also will have a course on socket preservation. So if you guys are interested in any of those courses, please reach out to us at Colorado Surgical Institute. The code is HERO10 for 10% off our courses because we love Paul Etchison and his podcast, and we're here to help.